Chapter 1, EMS Systems. My name is Ashley Williams. I'm a critical care flight paramedic, and I'm going to be going through EMS systems with you today. Throughout this course, you're going to find that your primary resource is going to be your textbook. If you check the front of the back cover, you're going to find an online access code. If you go to www.jblearning.com and input that access code, you can download an audio book version of this five pound textbook and instead of carrying it everywhere with you, you can actually take the audiobook with you instead. Bottom line is guys, you got to read the book. You have to be in this book from now until the end of class. So everything that I tell you um, either in lecture or online, you should be able to back up a hundred percent in this textbook. As drivers or CPR drivers or MVOs right now, you guys have a role and a responsibility. Your job is to help perform CPR if needed, assist your EMT, and drive the patient to from point A to point B safely. You know what your role is. Your role right now is getting ready to expand drastically. When you take on patient care, it's important that you have a good knowledge base because you're going to be taking care of somebody's family member. As a driver right now, you're an integral part of a system, whether you realize it or not. Throughout this chapter, we're going to discuss what will be expected of you during the course, what requirements you're going to have to meet to be licensed, uh, and what you need to get certified in the state. You're also going to learn the difference between first aid training, EMR training, and the difference between an advanced EMT and paramedic. The EMS system is composed of a team of healthcare professionals that provide emergency care and transport to patients. These EMS systems are governed by state laws and federal rules and regulations. After completion of this course, you're going to be eligible to take the National Registry of EMTs. The great thing about West Virginia is we just actually swapped to a National Registry state. So what that means for you is once you pass the National Registry, we are going to create a packet for you and submit the packet to the state and you will automatically be an EMT in the state of West Virginia. They've started a lot of initiatives to try and make it easier to get your certification in each state. So when you hear people talk about the Mark King initiative uh, through the National Registry, um, they're able to file for reciprocity in those states. And the National Registry lists um, on their site exactly which states are involved in that process. After you pass the certification exam and you gain state licensure, then you're able to function on the ambulance as an EMT. West Virginia is a little bit different than most people. Most states have four training and licensure levels. This is what the national system is typically composed of. Now, in West Virginia, you're going to hear a little bit different uh, verbiage for some of these, so don't be surprised if you do. However, what will be testable is what we're going to go over right now. So the four training levels and licensure um, levels are EMR, which is emergency medical responder, EMT, which is the emergency medical technician, the AEMT, or Advanced Emergency Medical Technician, and the Paramedic. In West Virginia, we're a little bit different. You're going to hear EMRs, EMTs, um, then you're going to hear something called an EMT Intermediate, or I-99. That's basically our version of the Advanced EMT. However, with that being said, the I-99 program is quickly fading out, and the state no longer... Um, wants to back the I-99 program because the National Registry has pulled that exam from their website. So we're going to be transitioning as a state to the advanced EMT. The I-99 is actually able to do a little bit more ALS than what the advanced EMT can do. The paramedic, however, um, is really vastly different in the state of West Virginia because once you get your paramedic, um, they require a inter-facility transport addendum to your medic card. So it's called the C3 paramedic or the C3 certification. And it's basically an eight-hour class that you take um, that involves hands-on and testing 
um, which gets you to that level. Then you're going to hear um, mobile critical care paramedic, which is a separate course in the state of West Virginia that you can take after you've been a paramedic for three years. Those are called their MCCPs. Now, the way the system is set up right now, two CCT medics are required to go on any CCT call. The state's currently working on passing a process uh, for C2 paramedic, um, which basically is still CCT. However, it's going to be instead of two CCT providers and tying up two ambulances, one CCT medic will be able to take the transfer instead. Um, that's actually in the works right now. So there's some big changes coming um, throughout our state, especially in our system statewide. For the national system and what you need to know for testable purposes, EMR, EMT, AEMT, and paramedic. An emergency medical responder has very basic training. These are typically your firefighters in this area. So um, most of your fire departments in this area have uh, basic life support uh, first responders. They're basically taught very, very, very basic things to assist the ambulance crew whenever they arrive and assist the patient prior to the ambulance arrival. So for example, if you're down in Wyoming County, they dispatch out the emergency medical responders for CPR in progress. So the first responders get there and perform CPR till you're able to get there and take over. So these fire department members actually are a very, very important part of our system and actually can be of huge benefit on these very rural calls. They can help with loading, they can help with CPR, so they're super beneficial to us in a lot of ways. Now what you need to know as the EMT, these emergency medical responders are of huge benefit to us, however they can actually become a little bit of a hindrance on scene if you don't manage them appropriately. So as the EMT you've got to kind of direct them to do the right thing. So you know you might have to tell them they're not doing good chest compressions, um, but just be tactful in the way that you do it. Explain to them that, you know, what you're looking for is this, and this is what they should be doing. Um, but, you know, have a little bit of professionalism about it. Don't talk down to them. They're there to help. Uh, these guys have a big hearts and truly, truly, truly care about their community and care about the people in their community. So they wouldn't be volunteering if they didn't. And remember, you're getting paid for these calls. They're not getting paid. They're volunteering their time. So it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you're dealing with Joe, the volunteer firefighter, who um, is doing terrible chest compressions. You're exhausted. This is like your 16th call of the day, you know, and here you are three o'clock in the morning dealing with Joe who is freaking out. So you got to learn how to manage Joe appropriately or he'll get in your way a little bit and annoy you more. The big thing is talk to him like a professional because he truly is there to help you. An EMT is a little bit more basic than an emergency medical responder. They have basic life support training. This includes the ability to use an AED, uh, which is the automated external defibrillator which if you've never used an AED, um, there's functions on there that allow you to analyze the rhythm, to shock a shockable rhythm, and the system is smart to know the diff smart the system is smart enough to know the difference. EMTs can also put in airway adjuncts, king airways, and assist patient with certain medications. So remember I said an advanced EMT is a little bit more advanced than an EMT and can do a little bit more um, advanced life support things than just a basic EMT. They can actually initiate IVs and administer a very limited number of emergency medications. The paramedic, however, has extensive ALS training, which includes endotracheal intubation, emergency pharmacology, cardiac chemodynamic monitoring, cardiac monitoring, and several other advanced assessment and treatment skills. They can do um, pretty much everything that they could do in the emergency room setting. So basically, they're a little mini ER out in the field.
Your EMT course includes four different types of learning activities. The great thing about these four types of learning activities is they truly cover every single type of learner that's out there. So for me myself, I'm more of what you call a tactile learner. I like to put my hands on things. So I learn better by actually doing the procedure. So I can read about it um, all day long, but I don't really understand the process until I actually put it in my hand and I'm able to play with it. So I'm kind of of the mindset, uh, watch one, do one, and then I like to teach it because you don't truly understand something um, until you have to teach it to somebody else. Basically. Uh, with these four learning activities, you're going to be reading assignments, listening to lectures, and listening to several classroom discussions on different topics. And that's going to give you your basis of your, um, your basically your knowledge basis. The step-by-step -step demonstrations are going to show you how to do the hands-on, and then you're going to have to practice it over and over again repeatedly in small groups before you have an examiner actually sign you off on it. So what we'll do on a typical lab day is we'll have the lab set up for you. Um, let's just use, for example, the uh, oral airway station. There's a um, oral airway skills checkoff sheet which goes through every single step that you're supposed to perform for the oral airway. So when you come in, I'm going to demonstrate exactly how to insert an oral airway according to that sheet. Then you're going to break off into groups and practice putting the oral airway in the right way according to that sheet, step by step by step. Remember, guys, this is where um, some of you are going to get a little tangled up. What we do in the classroom is what you have to do for testing. Not what the cool guy does in the street. So if you've got, you know, medics out there teaching you a trick or a shortcut or you've got other EMTs out there trying to show you different ways to do it than what I'm teaching you or what Tracy's teaching you, um, just know that they've earned the right to perform those tricks. You haven't yet. You've got to show competency and show that you're capable of following the basics of the step. Then a summary skill sheet. Uh, will be provided, which again, you've got to memorize the sequence of steps to perform the skill. There's going to be a lot of steps to this. It's going to be a lot of rote memorization. So for those of you who struggle a little bit with memorizing things, you need to print out these sheets and read them before you go to bed every single night. So once you start reading through these sheets, you're going to be able to spit it out like word vomit. Then you're going to have several case presentations and scenarios used in class to help you learn how to apply the knowledge. So once we get the basic knowledge down as class advances, we're going to put you in different scenarios to where you're actually performing the skills that you've learned. So we're going to take all these little skills and put them into actual hands-on scenarios. I've said it before and I'll say it again. EMTs save paramedics every day. EMTs are the backbone of the EMS system in the United States. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't have half the patients moved that get moved. We wouldn't have half of these patients get any kind of care prior to an ALS provider getting to these patients. So, you know, you guys need to understand your role is going to be very, very, very important. Not only are you going to provide care to the sick and injured, you're going to be managing a lot of life-threatening situations, a lot of dangerous traumas, um, you know, and you're going to be taking patients to dialysis, which, you know, can become monotonous at times. But the thing of it is, guys, they have to have dialysis. That is a life-saving intervention for those patients, and it prolongs their life and time with their families, which is truly what we're all in this for. Some of the subjects that we're going to be going through in the textbook, um, your scene size up, patient assessment, treatment and packaging, and EMS as a career, because you kind of have locked into a career. There are a lot of licensure requirements. Just because you get your EMT certification doesn't mean that um, you're finished with just EMT. You're signing on for a lifelong learning process. I learn something new 
every day, and I just passed my critical care flight paramedic exam. So I'm a certified flight paramedic. But there are things that I learn new every day. If you come into this with the idea that you're never going to learn anything new and you're an unteachable employee, you're not going to last very long in EMS. EMS is constantly changing. Medicine is constantly changing. That's why they call it practicing medicine. So when we talk about licensure requirements, the, it's going to differ a little bit from state to state. But the bottom line is, as an EMT, you have to have your high school diploma or GED. You have to be able to provide proof of immunizations. you got to be able to take your flu shot, because if you're not taking your flu shot, you're exposing our patients to um, unnecessary risks. Not only yourself, I mean, you're exposing yourself as well. You have to show that you've successfully completed a background check and um, passed a drug screening and that you hold a valid driver's license. Once you have successfully completed the course, you have to take a certification exam. You have to set for the National Registry. You have to be able to demonstrate that you can handle this job not only physically um, but mentally as well. And you have to be able to perform all aspects of that position. Uh, you have to be able to show that you have competencies and know how to be a good EMT. You have to show that you're compliant with all the state, local, and um, federal regulations. And we, as your employer, have to show that you've met every single one of the competencies that are required for you to gain your certification. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 protects people who have a disability. They can't be denied access to programs and services that are provided by state or local government. Basically, it prohibits employers from failing to provide full and equal employment opportunities to the disabled. Title I protects EMTs with disabilities who are seeking gainful employment under many circumstances. Employers with a certain number of employees are required to adjust the processes so that a candidate with a disability can be considered for a position and modify the work environment or how the job is normally performed. Personal background in accordance with state and criminal regulations require uh, prohibiting individuals who have committed either misdemeanors or felonies from becoming EMS providers. In the state of West Virginia, if you have a misdemeanor or a um, a domestic violence petition, then your uh, application has to be reviewed prior to you gaining licensure. When we talk about EMS system, it's always important to understand the history of something and know where our roots come from. EMS as we know it today is actually fairly young um, because EMS today uh, actually didn't even really originate the way it is now until about 1970. EMS in America can actually be traced back to the Civil War era. All military personnel had to be examined by medical officers to qualify for duty. The ambulances were then assigned based on the size of the regiment, and each ambulance team was trained in patient care to better take care of the soldiers. It wasn't until 1865 that Cincinnati actually incorporated the first civilian ambulance. It was in 1869 that New York City actually advertised a 30-second response time, and you guys are going to get a kick out of this. They provided not only a surgeon, but a quart of brandy for their patients as well. During World War I, they started using signal boxes. Um, basically, if the soldier was injured, the signal boxes were used, and then a medical team was dispatched to the field to locate the provider, or I'm sorry, locate the soldier and get them off the field. The medical teams also used an electric, steam, and gasoline-powered carriage uh, in order to transport the sick and the injured. After the civilian ambulance started carrying surgeons, they started equipping them with radios and dispatchers in order to help better serve the community. The transition that we know now as modern EMS really got its start in about the 1970s. It was about 1960 when John F. Kennedy declared that traffic accidents constitute one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest, of the nation's public health problems. It was in 66 that Lyndon Johnson and the President's Commission on Highway Safety 
the National Academy of Sciences declared the carnage the neglected disease of the modern society. Soon after that, the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Act was adopted, which standardized EMS training. It promoted state involvement and encouraged community oversight, um, and it recommended that radios be used for communication. EMS as we know it today really originated with this 1966 publication. Um, from that, in 1970, the first EMT training curriculum was created and implemented. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons prepared and published the first EMT textbook in 71. It's often called the Orange Book. Your textbook that you're listening to or looking at right now is actually the 11th edition of that book. It has been almost four decades since Lyndon Johnson's Committee on Highway Tra Traffic Safety recommended the creation of a national certification to establish some uniform standards. The result of this recommendation was the inception of the National Registry of EMTs, which was formed in 1970. Since that time, pre-hospital emergency medical care has continually evolved and improved. The EMT has finally been acknowledged as a member of the healthcare team. Excellent training programs have been developed that focus on continuing education. National standards have been established and ambulance equipment and essentials continue to grow. The NREMT, among others, has helped establish, implement, and maintain uniform requirements for the certification and recertification of the emergency medical technician. The NREMT has also been involved in numerous national projects and its staff participates on major national committees, playing an active part in the ever-continuing process of improving the standards across the board. The National EMS Scope of Practice Model provides guidelines for EMS skills. This document provides principal guidelines for the minimum skill level of each EMS provider and what they should be able to perform. Note that I said should there. The state level provides laws and regulations that the EMS provider must follow at the operations level and at the patient care level as well. At the local level, there's a medical director in place that provides daily oversight. They also provide support to EMS personnel and are involved actively in the QA or QI process, which is the quality assurance, quality improvement process. Examples include medications that will be carried on an ambulance or where patients are to be transported to. In West Virginia, we have state protocols and guidelines in place for you to follow. Each, as an EMT, you have exact protocols for chest pain, exact protocol for shortness of breath. So you're going to be given a chest pain call. You follow the scope of practice for the chest pain call. So as an EMT, you're going to administer aspirin and put your patient on oxygen. And it's going to walk you through step by step what you're supposed to do. If the patient does X, you do Y. There's no confusion with our state protocols on what you're supposed to do. There's no reason you should be stepping outside of that state protocol at all. You have to understand that at the local level, when your director puts your name, her name behind your name, that is so much responsibility for her she has a very high expectation of you. So it's not just your license on the line, it's hers as well. When we look at the levels of training, and hopefully this clarifies it a little bit, the national standard practice is pretty vast. And as an EMT, according to the nationwide standard, some EMTs can start IVs according to the standard. However, 
the EMS, the state of EMS office says EMTs can't start IVs. Our medical director says EMTs can't start IVs. So you can see where, you know, if you look at the bottom portion of that nationwide EMS scope of practice model, the big blue part is where that IV would fall. Now, advanced airway placement, for example, the King Airway, if you think about the King Airway in this very model that we're looking at, the nationwide practice says EMTs can insert King Airways. So it would fall right at the very top of the blue circle. The state office says you can put in a King Airway. Your protocol says if the patient is unconscious, unresponsive, with no gag reflex, you can put in a King Airway. So it falls to the left side of the circle in with the national standards. Our medical director, Dr. Stagger, says, I agree. I think it's a great thing for EMTs to put in a King Airway. And so it would fall at the very right-hand side of that circle. So you can see with where King Airways fall that every single component here says that we're allowed to do that. So King Airway would fall in the top of the blue circle with where everybody agrees you can do it and IV sticks would fall at the bottom of the blue circle meaning that you're not eligible to do that just to kind of give you an idea um, of what I'm talking about and like a visual representation so you can see exactly what I'm trying to explain to you here. Millions of lay people are trained in BLS and CPR. There's AEDs in almost every mall in America. Almost every school has an AED in it. So there's a ton of people that are trained in basic life support and CPR. Most schools require teachers to obtain CPR, and a lot of babysitters now are required to have their CPR certification. People who regularly accompany um, field trips are required to be trained in first aid and administration of um, certain medications. Automated external defibrillators or ADs are used by lay people. It basically walks you through. You lay the machine down and flip the cover open and it says remain calm, which sometimes is hard to do. It's important that it tells you that. It tells you place electrodes. You pick up the pads and there's pictures on them that walk you through where to stick the stickers at. Then it tells you Stand clear, which means stop doing the CPR and, and back up. And it says analyzing rhythm. There's two shockable rhythms that you need to be familiar with. It's VTAC and VFib. Those are the only two rhythms that AED is going to shock. Then if it determines it's a shockable rhythm, it's going to charge the defibrillator or the AED. As it charges, you're going to continue doing CPR. Once you're ready to deliver the shock, the machine doesn't just automatically do it. There's a red flashing button with a lightning bolt on it. So these things are designed to walk you through step by step on the process. Your emergency medical responders are taught very basic life support. They're taught how to do CPR how to stop the bleed, um, and that is really important for our law enforcement officers, our firefighters, our park rangers, uh, people that work in ski patrol. EMR training provides these individuals with the skills necessary to initiate immediate care. They're going to assist that patient until the EMT arrives. When you arrive there, they're going to give you the patient and give you a, a pretty decent report on what's been going on before you got there. It's important to not dismiss these providers and that you listen to them while they're talking to you. Good Samaritans are also trained in first aid and CPR and a lot of times will show up on scene. The most important thing for you guys to understand, they can be valuable to you. You need to learn how to utilize them. However, if you don't manage them appropriately, they can quickly become a hindrance and they can endanger themselves, endanger the patient, and endanger you. So it's important that you understand that you're not only responsible for your patient on scene, you're responsible for every person on that scene. So you're responsible for your safety, number one, your partner's safety, number two, then your patient, and then the community. So those people in the community are just as much your responsibility as your patient. EMTs are required to have 150 hours of classroom time. The EMT class is about 150 hours. 
The EMT has to have knowledge and skills to provide basic emergency care. They assume responsibility for assessing the patient, packaging the patient, and transporting the patient. They're a very integral part of our EMS system. The paramedic, however, requires an extensive amount of training. 1,000 to 1,300 hours in the classroom and internship alone. These are college courses and most of the time are associated uh, with an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree program. Not every program is an associate's or a bachelor's degree program, but they provide the ability for the student to have an associate's or bachelor's degree within a two-year time frame. Sometimes it's just a certificate course, which still allows you to test your medic at the national level. Their training is extensive. There are basically many ER physicians that are in Wyoming, McDowell, Mercer, um, and some of the farthest places that you can imagine away from the hospital. So they have to be able to think on their toes and perform a wide range of skills. When we think about the EMS system, there's 14 components that you need to be familiar with. I've talked about you being an integral part of the EMS system, and so now we're going to talk about what all the components are of that EMS system. Number one, public access. Two, clinical care. Three, medical direction. Four, integration of health services. And five, information systems. Six, prevention. Seven, EMS research. Eight, communication systems. Nine, human resources. Ten, legislation and regulation. Eleven, evaluation. Twelve, system finance. 13 public education and 14 education systems. These 14 components are kind of like a circle or a circle of systems and I can't help but talk about the circle of I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry like their wedding. It's like a circle, never ending, right? So the CMS system is a never ending system and it's important that all of the parts are present in that system or you can't complete the circle. When we think about public access, it's important to understand that I'm on one system. When somebody picks up the phone, whether it be cell phone or a landline and call 911, it triangulates their position and sends them to the closest 911 center. Raleigh County has a 911 center. Fayette County has a 911 center. So each county has their own 911 system in place. This makes it easier for the public to access or have access to the 911 system. At every dispatching center, there are dispatchers taking these calls. These dispatchers are most oftentimes trained in what's called EMD. So they provide emergency medical information to lay people prior to EMTs getting there. So they help people uh, understand, calm them down, and for example, help them perform CPR. They walk them through the instructions of how to do that over the phone. They've had extensive training to help somebody deliver a baby. So these EMDs and dispatchers are huge help to us in the EMS system. When you pick up the phone and call 911, you want somebody to answer, right? These dispatchers have to be able to answer the phone which means they have to have an, a working operating system. Once they get this phone call, they decide who needs to go, whether it be a fire agency, an ambulance, a police officer. Um, it may be a non-government, um, non-emergency official that they dispatch. It may even be animal control. Um, they take that caller information, and then it's their responsibility to send the appropriate vehicle or send the appropriate response team to that scene. New technology is actually in place that allows these dispatchers to kind of triangulate not only their position from their GPS on their phone, but there's also a system in place so that if you um, pay for the, the services, your landline will pop up on their computer screen and you can get 
a ambulance or a fire truck there a little quicker because they have your exact location. It's no, well, Johnny said go down the street a quarter of a mile and at the yellow house turn left. And when you go down a quarter of a mile, there's 14 yellow houses. So <laughs> don't laugh. You know, we've all been there. So, you know, these dispatchers are really important and their job and their role is so very important to what we do. So don't take your dispatchers for granted. When we think about clinical care, you have to think about having good equipment. You have to maintain your equipment daily. That's why there's daily checks for your truck. There's daily checks that you're supposed to perform on your AED. There's daily checks that you're supposed to perform on your glucometer. It describes these pieces of equipment and makes sure that we have the equipment we need for our scope of practice. It's so important that EMTs familiarize themselves with their primary service area. If you're going to an area that you're not familiar with, and trust me, it happens a lot, you need to have GPS on your phone or you need to have a map in your truck that you can read. Don't just buy the map from the shelf and think, oh, I'll be okay. If you've never used the map before, take it out and try to figure out where stuff is. Look at key things in the community. So find the community center, find the hospitals, know which hospital is the trauma center, know which hospital is the stroke center. It's so important that you, the EMT, know these things. Our human resources department's in place to focus on people who deliver the care. Their job is to care for those who are caring. They do get compensated for what they do and they interact they interact with members of the medical community. So they reach out to the health department and ensure that, you know, we have a good working relationship with our community. Efforts are underway to allow EMS providers to move from state to state. So the National Registry has been actively working on the Mark King Initiative, which means you take your National Registry, you can take it into Virginia and apply for state reciprocity and get a Virginia license. Or you can go to Florida and file for state reciprocity and get a Florida license and not be required to take their state test. When we think about medical direction, you need to understand that there is a doctor who backs your card up. If that doctor is not willing to back your card up or not willing to sign their name after yours, then you're not able to function as a provider in the state of West Virginia. That medical director authorizes the EMT to be able to provide care in the field. So if Dr. Staggers says that you did something negligent and she doesn't want to sign your na her name on your card anymore, you won't work at JanCare anymore under her direction. And she has a lot of pull through the legislation, a lot of pull through the state. So if you do something negligent, she could have your state card pulled. It's so important that you follow the standing orders and the protocols that are there because they're put in place not only to protect you, the provider, but they have been tested and tested and tested by providers and people who are way more educated than you and I are. The medical director acts as a liaison. Dr. Staggers isn't there to take your card. She's there to make sure that you do the right thing for the patient at the right time. Medical control can be either offline or online. Offline is indirect. There's standing orders in place. There's training in place. There's supervision in place. Online, however, or direct, means you speak directly to the physician and they give you directions over the phone or over the radio. Every call that you run, it's going to be your responsibility to pick up the phone and call in to regional command or medical command and give a report to the receiving to let them know what you're bringing in. That way you're not, surprise, I brought you a cardiac arrest, or surprise, I brought you a patient who's fixing to meet Jesus. So it's very important that you call in and that you're acting on medical direction. So as EMTs, you would call to get orders to administer an epinephrine injection for a patient in anaphylaxis. That's given either that's given IM in patients who have been stung by a bee, for example. They got stung by a bee, they're highly allergic, they're breaking out in hives, they're having trouble breathing, and you know uh, they need an EpiPen because you've seen this before and they need an EpiPen and everything indicates an EpiPen. Well, you can't just get an EpiPen off your truck and stab them in the leg. 
okay? You have to have a physician order to do that. So you call into regional and say, hey, I have this person in anaphylaxis, and this is what their vital signs are. They're having trouble breathing. Can I administer an epinephrine injection? And they're going to say, per Dr. So-and-so, go ahead and administer this medication at 2032. So it's really important that you have that medical direction when it's required. And on your state protocols, it's clearly written out. There's a big gray box that has a little doctor picture. So you'll know when you need to talk to the doctor. Or there's a big gray box that has a little red phone that says you need to pick up and talk to the paramedic at sitting in regional or medical command. Although each EMS system, medical direction, and training programs have some latitude, its training protocols and practices must follow state legislation, rules, regulations, and guidelines. A senior EMS official is usually in charge of necessary administrative tasks such as scheduling, personnel, budgets, purchasing, and vehicle maintenance. The daily operations of the ambulance crews are the responsibility of the company and it's our job to ensure that we follow the state rules and regulations that are put into place. These are no different than the police chief or the fire chief being required to follow state legislation and guidelines. Pre-hospital care by the EMT is coordinated with care administered by the receiving hospital. The care should be continued in the emergency department. This is why it's so important that when you bring a patient in, you don't just bring them in, dump them in a bed, and run out the door to go on your next call or run out the door to go to Pizza Hut. It's really important that you give your report and you explain to the nurse what you did in the back of the ambulance and what your problem is with your patient, if they have any allergies, what medications they're on, if you have the medications with you. So take time to give a report and make sure it's a good report. Your rapport with the hospital guys is going to be so important to you. If you come in and you just throw a patient in and you just kind of yammer and don't really like get to the point with the nurses, they're going to think that you're a bluttering, blubbering idiot and they're not going to want to talk to you anytime you come in there. If you come in there with a good attitude and you're willing to help them and you give them a good report and you make beds for them when they need you to or, you know, um, go out of the way to help them a little bit. If you build a good rapport with the hospital, guys, these nurses will look out after you. However, I would tell you, if you are not liked by the nurses at a facility, it ain't just one of them that ain't going to like you because Nurse A and Nurse B are going to be BFFs and you're going to make Nurse B mad. Well, then Nurse B and C are BFFs and then Nurse C hates you inadvertently because of Nurse A's beef with you. So when you go in, don't go in with an attitude. Go in with a positive attitude and go in with the, with the opinion that you can help them and help them move patients. And, you know, tell them if there's a patient going out, be like... Um, you know, hey, if you give me a bed, I'll take that patient home for you. You know, that's no big deal at all. If, if you know, if, if that's something that you need, we'd, we'd love to help you out. And then pick up the phone and call dispatch and be like, hey, um, they're going to get us a bed if we take this patient out of here. Uh, do you guys have a problem with that? Will you send us a push? You know, they're not going to care if you guys are doing calls. That integration ensures that there is a comprehensive continuity of care uh, for this patient. If you give aspirin and the patient gets to the hospital and they don't know that, the, that you've given aspirin, then they're going to repeat that aspirin dose. So instead of getting 324 milligrams of aspirin, your patient's now gotten 648 milligrams of aspirin, which, let's face it, guys, isn't what they need. They need the right amount of medication. So it's so important that you communicate with your nursing staff and with your physicians. EMS tries to collaborate with the hospital to improve treatment for patients with heart attacks and strokes. You're going to hear um, a lot on the JanCare page about um, patients who were having a STEMI who got to PCI. Well, what does that exactly mean? Well, let me explain it to you. When a patient is having a heart attack, they get an EKG done by the paramedic and by you guys. You guys are going to be doing EKGs. 
and it's going to say on the EKG what's going on with the patient. So it may say that the patient's having a inferior wall MI. Well, what that means is, is there's certain places on that EKG that don't look normal. That patient is very, very, very sick. That means that patient needs to go and get a heart cath done and have a stent put in so that they can get blood supply back to the, that particular area of the heart. If they don't get blood supply back to that area of the heart, the heart muscle dies. So time is cardiac. So if we can pr improve our times, not only our scene times, but the call to the hospital to tell them, hey, this patient's having a heart attack, and here's the 12 lead, let me send it to you, and they get a picture, and they'll confirm, yeah, it's a heart attack, they'll call their cath lab team in, and you won't go to the emergency room, you'll go stay straight to the cath lab to what's called PCI, um, which is going to change your patient's outcome drastically. If you call a stroke alert, they're going to get the CT scanner ready for that patient because we know if a patient's having a stroke, we only have three hours of a window to get that patient their thrombolytic therapy, which means to give them the clot buster that's going to break up that stroke. If we don't get those thrombolytics on board, that patient is going to have permanent deficits. So it is very, very, very important that you guys collaborate with the receiving hospital and that you become an integral part of our team to make a difference. There's a new method of delivery in healthcare. It really started just a few years ago. It's really, really young. It's in its baby phase of life. And we do have some mobile integrated healthcare EMTs and mobile integrated healthcare community paramedics in JanCare that actively work here right now. Um, they have been trained in community medicine and mobile integrated healthcare. And basically, their role is um, once the patient's discharged from the hospital, they do a follow-up visit with that patient. So they go in and try to prevent future falls, for example. So let's say the patient has been seen at the hospital for 67 falls since January. Well, the role of the mobile integrated healthcare provider is to go to that home and figure out why is this patient falling 67 times? Are there, you know, 57 steps they're trying to go down that they're falling down? Uh, maybe their sidewalks uneven. So the mobile integrated healthcare provider will go into the house, do a, a site visit and evaluation, and figure out, hey, I want to, I want to prevent you from falling again. Let me, let me help you fix this and come up with a way to fix it. So they have to work a lot in the community and have a lot of connections to get these things worked out. They basically will work with the physician too. Like let's say that the patient is bed confined. Instead of taking them back to the hospital, you know, for a sinus infection and exposing them to all the bacteria in the hospital and everything that they are in the hospital for, you know, basically the provider will go to the scene, evaluate the patient and be like, oh, they, you know, they need a prescription of augmentin. So they'll call the physician and be like, hey, this person needs a prescription of augmentin for the sinus infection. So the doctor says, okay, and writes a script, you know, or has the community paramedic write a script for the augmentin for the uh, provider to go, or for the patient to go get filled. So um, really, like I said, this is a very baby, uh, this is pretty much in its very baby phase right now. Um, but really, it's all about working with the community, and it's really the, the primary goal is to prevent hospital readmissions, and it's to prevent patients from being seen in the ER for the same thing over and over and over again. And they work with the hospital, um, they'll work with the social workers, and um, also with the patient care services at the hospital to ensure that they're seeing the right patients and that they get into contact with these patients in the appropriate time frame. This new branch of healthcare is causing the evolution of additional training levels of EMS providers. So one new aspect um, that I kind of touched on before just a second is the community paramedic. These are experienced paramedics who receive advanced training to equip them to provide services within a community. In addition to the patient care services a paramedic would typically provide, 
the services provided by the community paramedic may include uh, performing a health screening, monitoring chronic illnesses or conditions, for example, COPD, um, you know, because in our area, black lung is a big deal because of the coal mines. They're going to come into the house and obtain lab samples, urine specimens. They're going to administer their immunizations and basically serve as a huge patient advocate. You got to remember, Granny doesn't always have family. So she gets sent home and Granny may fall. Who's checking on Granny? So the community paramedics are going to make and establish contact with patients and they're going to become their patient advocate. As EMTs, you're going to be providing care to patients. That care is regulated by the medical director like we talked about earlier. It's your job and your responsibility to ensure that patients get the right care. But it's also the medical director's responsibility to maintain quality control within our EMS system. The Continuous Quality Improvement Program, or CQI, allows the physician and other providers um, to review and perform audits of the EMS system to identify areas of improvement and assign remedial training. If you, the EMT, administer 20 liters of oxygen through a nasal cannula, that's a problem. The most a nasal cannula can give is six liters. So if you're doing 20 liters of oxygen through a nasal cannula as an EMT, that's bad medicine. So of course, if you're not remediated, you're going to continue to do 20 liters of oxygen through a nasal cannula. So there has to be QA, QI processes in place and quality improvement plans so that you know next time you're not going to give any more than six liters on a cannula. Information and skills in emergency medical care change constantly. There has to be constant refresher training and continuing education and that's your job to get those training hours. We teach the classes constantly. You'll see out there that we're constantly offering continuing education. One class you guys are going to see coming up soon is ACLS for the EMT. I'm going to teach you as EMTs to be as advanced as possible and you guys are going to be smart when you come out of EMT class. That continuing education is important. It's also important because your national registry is a two-year card. So let's say that we finish class in June and you guys test for National Registry, your card will be good for two years. In that two-year time frame, you're required to get 48 hours of additional training, whether it be online or in person. Now, not all of it can be online. Um, I think they've got it to about two-thirds of it just about you can complete online, but the other third you have to be in the classroom. So if you think about it, when you finish EMT class, you really need to start thinking about additional classes to take for continuing education hours. And you need to make sure that you're putting that into the National Registry site, which we'll talk about later, um, so that that tracks that and you can keep up with your hours. The whole goal of evaluation, guys, is to minimize errors. Errors, of course, are inevitable. Med errors, um, communication errors, documentation er errors, you know, errors are going to happen. But our role in education is to evaluate you on your skills to make sure that we minimize those errors. We want to limit errors not only from, you know, the aspect of, well, nobody wants to be sued, to we want to do the right thing for patients and provide good quality patient care that when the that way when the family looks at your trip sheet they know you did everything possible for their family member information systems are used to efficiently document the care that has been delivered it's so important to document guys i can't preach documentation enough if you didn't document it it didn't happen once it's stored electronically, the information can be used not only to come back and bite you in the butt, but it can also be used to improve patient care. For example, stored information can help determine how often a department has seen specific types of symptoms, or they've seen specific types of trauma patient, or what our average on-scene time for trauma patients are, our need for educational sessions um, based off of what you've 
what you've done and what you've documented. Let's just say everybody across the board is putting a patient on um, on a backboard for every single call they go on. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do. So if we see every single person putting a backboard on every single patient, clearly there's a need for an education session um, to teach you when to use a backboard appropriately. Um, and we can also use these for national trends too. So we may see a rise in uh, shortness of breath calls and it might be seasonal. We may be able to track, okay, well, we're going to see an increase um, pneumonia cases in wintertime. So then we may get patients to, you know, get a pneumonia vaccination prior. So, so what you document is, is truly so important. Finance systems vary depending on the organization. GenCare is a privately owned company, so we can't access any grants. We don't have the ability to do those things because this is a private organization. And you can see private organizations account for about 39.6% of EMS transport services. Fire department accounts for about 37.5%. And the third service um, is basically kind of like out of, uh, a hospital-based system which only counts for about 23 percent so really the finance of the system varies from department to department where our system is a private organization um, our finances are a little bit different because we're not eligible for state or federal grants so we have to be very careful how we document things and very careful how you know we bill for things because we're responsible to ensure all of the, those processes are done the correct way and make sure that um, all of our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted so to speak because um, if Medicare or Medicaid were to come in and perform an audit we have to show that your documentation backs up what we're billing for. Personnel can be paid, volunteer, or a mixture of volunteer or paid. EMTs may be asked to gather insurance information, secure signatures, or obtain permissions from patients to bill their insurance. At Jane Care, where we're a private company, you have to get signatures from patients and patients' family. It's very imperative that you get your signatures. If a patient's going from hospital A to hospital B, we have to have a medical necessity form saying why that patient needed an ambulance. Um, or a, fit, a, a physician certification statement as to why that patient needed an ambulance. We also are required to get an ambulance billing authorization form signed, either by the patient or patient family member. It's best to have a patient or a family member sign these forms. It's best if you don't sign the forms. There are times you're going to have to, and that you're not in any way taking legal responsibility for their payment. It just means nobody was available to sign, and that's your signature saying, hey, there's nobody available to sign right now. So you're going to find that your signatures are huge, huge, huge deals when you start running on the truck. As an EMT instructor in the state of West Virginia, you're required to have been an EMT for four years and you're required to have a NAMSI certification. So there's a lot of things that go into being an EMT. An ALS instructor or director must hold a four-year degree. They must provide training either in a college environment, adult career center, or hospital setting. In West Virginia, you have to have been a paramedic for four years and hold an active paramedic license also have to have NAMSI certification as well. So if, it's, if being an, an educator is something that you plan on doing in the future. Prevention and public education is one of the most important things as an EMS agency that we can take part in. If we can help prevent injuries and illnesses from happening in our community, then it alleviates a lot off of the EMS system um, because a lot of times now when people call 911, the system gets overwhelmed because you have people calling 911 for recurrent issues. That's one of the biggest things uh, with the formation of the Mobile Integrated Healthcare Program. We're trying to prevent patients from 30-day uh, hospital readmission. So we do try to educate the public as much as we possibly can based off of the data and statistics that we obtain from your charting information. 
the big emphasis is on prevention. So we know a lot of car accidents take place because of drunk driving. So we implemented a lot of programs um, such as SAD, uh, Students Against Drunk Drivers, and those sort of programs, uh, Prom Promise, and things that we participate in to help educate the public on the dangers of drunk driving. Uh, one of the big pushes right now is distracted driving um, because we're seeing a, a huge increase in people sending text messages out and trying to drive their car. What EMS basically does is works with all of the public health agencies on primary and secondary prevention. So we try to do as much public education that we can't and ensure that we keep our communities as safe as possible. The following charts highlights uh, some of these examples of public health accomplishments. EMS research is huge in the system because it helps determine the shape of EMS and where we're going for the future. So like I've talked about mobile integrated healthcare a little bit, that's really where EMS is moving to and that's based solely off of the research that we've done throughout EMS for several years. So we've come up with this mobile integrated healthcare system to help minimize hospital readmissions and to get our providers into the houses of patients who might not be seeing family members daily. Basically, it's a way to um, make all of this evidence-based research practical. There are several different roles as an EMT that you're going to play in gathering data, so it's important that you document everything that's required of you in your trip sheets. Like I said before, guys, your roles and responsibilities are getting ready to change drastically. It's your responsibility to keep your vehicle clean and your equipment ready. It's not, well, uh, so-and-so made me run and I told him I didn't have or um, I tried to tell him I wasn't ready to take this call. No. If you don't have your equipment, it's your responsibility to ensure you have it. It's your responsibility to ensure that your AED is charged. If you get on scene and you're doing CPR on a patient and you pull out the AED and put the pads on a patient and your AED's dead, how is that going to look on you, the provider? Because you can come up with all your excuses. All the excuses in the world aren't going to affect that patient's life, and it's not going to change the opinion of those people on scene that saw you be an incompetent EMT. Your safety is huge throughout your daily activity. You're going to hear me say that a lot throughout this course. Your safety is number one. It's your job to ensure safety, not only for yourself, but for your partner, and the people on your scene are also your responsibility. You need to be familiar with your emergency vehicle operations, which as MVOs, you've learned a lot about being in the ambulance and a lot of what the ambulance is capable of, but it's a whole completely different role of learning those operations from the back of the ambulance. You need to know how to um, place, a, blah, place a patient on oxygen, and you need to know how to change out an oxygen tank. You need to be familiar with how to change out a battery on a monitor and how to change a battery out an AED. And those are some things that we're going to be going over throughout this course, especially when you get to your hands-on portion. Another big thing is you're getting ready to go from being an MVO where you have no responsibilities to taking over the leadership on scene. You're getting ready to be the one in charge. You're going to be the one making the decisions. When you get there, you're the only person that's going to be standing between the patient and the grave. And that's a lot of leadership responsibilities. You've got to be the duck on the water, the calm in the storm. You know, you what, I, what that means is, is, even though the scene's chaotic, you need to be able to rise above that chaos and remain calm. Don't let the flow of the scene flow your actions. It's your job to do a good scene evaluation. It's your responsibility to call for ALS backup when you need it. And it's your decision on which hospital the patient goes to ultimately. Now, does the patient have a say in where they go? Absolutely. But if they're having a stroke, the best place to go isn't to a non-stroke center. It is to the stroke center every time. It's best not to take a patient that's having, um, you know, a STEMI and you know they're having a STEMI to plateau. It's your responsibility to make the decision to go to Raleigh General and to be competent enough in your decision to know that you need ALS backup and route to intercept you. So you're getting ready to really expand on what your role and responsibilities are. So if you're not in this textbook reading and studying, 
you guys are going to be in way over your heads. You know, don't just study to pass the test. My job isn't to teach you to get ready to pass the test. Yeah, do I want you to pass? Absolutely. But the bottom line is, when you're standing there and it's your decision on the line, I want to know that you're making the right decision. And if it's my family laying on the concrete, I want to know that you know how to backboard the patient properly because not only did you read it in a textbook but you put your hands on it and you did it multiple times and you were successfully checked off by an instructor so guys I'm gonna push you hard and you're gonna have a lot of responsibility in this course and a lot of things that you're responsible for learning on your own but don't think when you get here that I'm not gonna grill you on it because it's a lot to take in over just a short amount of time So we talked about calling for additional resources. It's important to know when you're in over your head. You need to know when to call for ALS backup. You need to know when you need lift assistance. Don't get out here, guys, and try to behemoth the stretcher into the back of the ambulance with 500-pound patient. That's not your job to do that. You know, it's nice now because you guys have electric stretchers. I used to stand up at uh, Charleston Memorial and pretend by the Kanawha County people because I thought they were the bee's knees that they had electric stretchers, and we didn't. So I just made noises with my mouth. <laughs> Don't laugh. You've probably seen me do it. Um, but so, guys, it's it's also really important that you are able to gain access to patients and that you have a good rapport with these facilities. It's also your job to perform a patient assessment. I can't tell you how many times I watch EMTs go up to dialysis and read the blood pressure readings off the machine, barely look at their patient, talk to them, ask them maybe, you know, what they're going to eat for lunch, throw them in the back of the ambulance, run across the road to Harper Road to a nursing home, take the patient out, dump them in the facility, and then leave. That is not patient care, guys. I will tell you, our dialysis patients are some of the absolute sickest patients that you could possibly transport. Do not trust that vital sign reading off that machine. You need to be assessing that patient. Every 15 minutes for a stable patient, every 5 minutes for a critical patient, and I'm going to say that again because it's really important, you need to be assessing your patient every 15 minutes for an unstable patient, every 5 minutes for an, an unstable patient. So again, 15 minutes if they're stable, 5 minutes if they're unstable. Make sure that you're performing a patient assessment. If you're performing a patient assessment, guys, you have to put your hands on the patient. If you're not touching your patient, you're not doing an assessment. If you're just saying, oh, lung sounds are equal and clear, you know, and you never pick up a stethoscope, how you know the lung sounds are equal and clear? If you say abdomen soft non-tender and your hands never touch the patient, how do you know their abdomen is soft non-tender? But you're documenting it, right? So... This is the big thing that catches a lot of people coming out of class because they saw their partners do it. I'm telling you guys, don't get hung up on that. Don't get to be a lazy EMT. Be the EMT that does the right thing for the patient every time. If you're taking a patient to a, a nursing home on Harper Road, it doesn't matter. You still need to have two sets of vital signs on that patient. Take it when you get in the ambulance and take it when you get to the receiving facility. You need to make sure that you're giving the appropriate care to these patients. They're paying for it, trust me. And they're paying for your expertise in the back of the truck. And there's a lot of times that our EMTs have caught things that were wrong with the patient and have made some big discoveries that prevented that patient from being a very, very critical patient later on, as in their blood sugar bottomed out on them or their blood pressure was super high and they needed more medication. So don't think that your role isn't huge in this system process. Don't think just because it's dialysis that it's okay to do things halfway. You need to make sure you're being efficient and you're being thorough because at the end of the day, guys, you're the one that has to stand behind your decisions. As an EMT, sometimes it's going to be your task just to give emotional support. Sometimes these patients just need an ear, somebody to listen to them. They need somebody to listen to them vent, complain. They get frustrated. 
you know they went from being active to you know maybe they have a hip fracture and now they're in rehabilitation and ended up on dialysis because of all the stuff that they've been through so they went from having a very active lifestyle to now they're bed confined and trying to do physical therapy to get their strength back that takes a lot on somebody emotionally so sometimes they just need an ear they need somebody to listen to them. Sometimes Granny needs you to hold her hand and tell her it's going to be okay as she goes back and forth to dialysis five times a week. You know, sometimes families need you to be the person that they lean on because you're telling them that, you know, we're doing CPR and we're keeping the heart beating, but, you know, we're coming to the end of our time of doing CPR and we've done everything that we can do possibly uh, that we could have possibly done. And, you know, so it's a big role to be that emotional support system. Don't be callous, guys. You need to have a good rapport not only with your patients but with facilities. You need to be professional and be courteous. When somebody asks you a question, you should be answering yes ma'am, no ma'am. And treat these people with respect because it, trust me when I tell you they deserve your respect. It's your job to maintain that continuity of care. If the patient is at a nursing home, they're under care. They're either under the care of an LPN or an RN there. and your job is to maintain that continuity of care and make sure that you're taking the patient's vital signs, that you're doing the assessments, that you're making sure the patient's blood glucose stays where it's supposed to be. One of the biggest things that I see um, EMTs make the mistake of doing is bringing the emergency into the back of their ambulance and into the hospital. Remember guys, this is not your emergency. If your patient's in a car wreck, and people on scene are hysterical and they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And if you haven't seen it, trust me, you're going to. It's your job to be that calm in the storm and help resolve that emergency situation and that emergency incident. Give people calm, reassuring tones to let them know that things are going to be okay. It's your responsibility to uphold medical and legal standards, too. You have to know what the laws are, guys. You can't punch a patient in the face. That's not okay in any realm or any aspect of things. It's also not okay for you to start an IV on a patient as an EMT. It's your job to know what your scope of practice is and, and work in your scope of practice. So once you finish this course, it's going to be your responsibility to follow the state protocols. You're going to be your biggest patient advocate. Remember, it's our job to advocate for our patients. I can't stress that enough. You have to be the voice for this patient. They're sick. They're weak. You know, normally they're on top of their game, you know, and, and can be at the DMV and take it like a boss. But they're so overwhelmed, not only sometimes with the diagnosis, but all of the physicians in and out of the room, that they don't know how to handle their emotions. They don't know the questions to ask. Ensure that you protect your patient's privacy and make sure that you advocate for your patient. I can't stress that enough, guys. As EMTs, that is what my biggest care and concern was for my patients. I wanted to be my patient's biggest advocate. I wanted to make sure that my patient got the best care possible. So whether you guys realize it or not, as an EMT, you've just committed to a lifelong learning process. As an EMT and a medic, it's your responsibility to continually learn because we have to have continuing education hours. Not only that, medicine is constantly changing. That's the reason why they call it practicing medicine. I mean, legit, we've been killing people for years with some of the stuff we've been doing, and we're just now getting smart enough to know that, hey, we were probably doing the wrong thing for these patients. We probably shouldn't have been doing that. Let's try this now instead. You need to be constantly trying to develop yourself professionally. You need to cultivate and sustain community relationships, not only with your churches, your community centers, uh, your youth in this area. You need to try to find a way to give back. You know, right now there's a big push for uh, the Narcan program, and so we're trying to help uh, with the overdose population here in West Virginia. But there's a lot of other things that we can do. You know, um, I try to participate in Prom Promise, so you'll see me do a lot of the moulage stuff with Prom Promise because I think it's so important that the kids know that drinking and driving is dangerous. You don't see a lot of D.A.R.E. programs in schools anymore. You see the SAD programs still going, but not a lot about drugs in high schools anymore. This is a problem. We need to come back to making sure 
that we're providing the knowledge base for our communities and making sure that they know to be aware of what these problems are progressing into. So our youth of America are having drug problems. They're advancing to adults and calling 911 constantly. And we're picking them up for overdose after overdose after overdose. And it's bleeding our system out of resources and out of financial, you know, and from a financial aspect as well. So we need to come up with ways to improve that. We've got to come up with ways to, you know, uh, advocate for our patients in the sense that maybe we should be going and educating our communities on the dangers of opiate overdose or the dangers of methamphetamine and you know that sort of thing so you got to find a way to give back to your profession professionalism is one of the biggest things as an EMT that you could possibly portray to the public you need to have integrity that means you need to be honest. Don't lie to your patients. Don't be a thief. Be trustworthy. Have empathy. Show that the patient that that you're aware and thoughtful of what their needs are and that, you know, that you're being very conscientious of the fact that they're sick and that maybe you need to tell your partner to maybe avoid some of the bumps instead of telling the patient to suck it up and to be all right, buttercup. You need to have some self-motivation. You need to discover problems and solve the problems without someone directing you to do it. When you come in on shift, you're going to find that the truck's not right. It's your responsibility to make the truck right. You know, if you're missing nasal cannulas, then put in the order for nasal cannulas. Maybe somebody didn't do... Um, didn't do their inventory stuff the right way because they just didn't really feel like it. It's your job to fix that. You have to have some self-motivation as an EMT. Your appearance and hygiene are very important. You're going to hear us stress your appearance and hygiene when you come to class. And your appearance and hygiene should be important to you on your truck as well. If you look like a professional and act like a professional, you definitely want to smell pleasant. Because after you've been on for 96 hours, let me just tell you, you don't smell pleasant to be around if you haven't bathed. Your patient shouldn't have to deal with it, your partner shouldn't have to deal with it, and the ambulance shouldn't smell like a dirty locker room. If you look professional, you're motivated, you have compassion, you're empathetic, your self-confidence is going to skyrocket. Hold your shoulders back. You're an EMT, and your community is looking to you to be that professional. Time management is really important. You're going to find time management being super important part of this class. You need to perform and delegate multiple tasks while ensuring the efficiency as well as your safety. Make sure that you're an effective communicator. Make sure that you're communicating effectively not only with your patient but also with dispatch. Make sure that people have an understanding of what you're trying to re relay because sometimes those lapses in communication can cause um, deficiencies in patient care. Teamwork is huge. A lot of times I see people just worry about themselves and their ambulance and, and that's it. Guys, we're in this together. We're a team. We have to work as a team. It's so important that you work with a team with the hospitals and with your peers on the ambulance. We're not out to get everybody here. You need to make sure that you're working as a team. So if your patient is really really sick that when the hospital sees you come in they trust you enough to know if you've got the look on your face that you probably need a bed pretty quick and that comes from teamwork helping them make the bed if they need it you know telling them hey I'll take that transfer out of here if you get me you know if you give me that bed I'll take that patient out of here no big deal you know work work together you know if somebody's outside washing the ambulance get out there and help them wash the ambulance it doesn't matter that you've already washed your truck for the day you know, they might have been on a call all night long and now they're, you know, downtown on coverage and the crew's exhausted and they haven't eaten, you know, and they need to wash the truck because they're driving by, you know, the headquarters and they want to make sure their truck's clean. Go give them a hand. It's all about respect, guys. You need to show respect not only to your patients but to your peers as well and to the nursing staff. I can tell you this. People respect me and my decision-making abilities. If I've tell them it's a STEMI and I send them the report 
then trust me when I tell you they get the cath lab ready, or I'll bypass seven or eight stretchers in the hallway because the facilities have a respect for my decision making and my patient care. But that's come from several years of building that respect and working together as a team. So a lot of this goes hand in hand. You have to be your patient advocate, guys. Sometimes people are quick to dismiss you. They might be busy. There might be seven or eight ambulances in the waiting room, but you might have just treated your patient for anaphylaxis, and they might be going back into anaphylaxis again. The effects of the medication could have wore off, and it's your job to advocate for your patient and be like, look, I know it's really busy. I understand that, but, you know, I treated for anaphylaxis. My medication's wearing off. If we don't get this patient in a bed and get them treated again, we're going to have to intubate the patient in the hallway. <laughs> You're going to have to intubate the patient in the hallway. So you have to be the, your patient advocate and make sure that you're getting the patient what they need when they need it. Just don't be too pushy because they don't like that either, but you also need to know you don't want to waste any time if your patient is truly, truly ill and you know they are. Careful delivery of care. You've got to pay attention to details. If you're transferring a patient from a wheelchair to the bed, make sure that you're protecting their skin. These little elderly people, they have really thin skin, so you're liable to transfer a patient over, catch their arm on the wheelchair, and it rip their skin open, you know, and cause them to bleed, and you have to bandage it, and then you have to report it to the nursing staff and to, you know, and to, um, Mike, Safety Mike, so that he can do a report on it as well. You know, so make sure that you're being careful when you transfer these patients. Your patient is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to make sure that patient gets adequate care, and it's your responsibility to make sure that that care is delivered in a safe manner. Every patient is entitled to compassion, respect, and the best of care. People get annoyed at running calls. What do you want to do? Get paid for sleeping on station? Yeah, that'd be nice, but that's not what pays our paychecks, guys. Our patient is not an inconvenience. They should never be an inconvenience to you. Because let me tell you something. As much as you hate getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to take that patient to dialysis, because trust me, I've been there. Don't think I don't know how aggravating it is. It's just as frustrating to know that you have to go sit in that dialysis chair for three hours without having anything to eat and nobody to sit there with you during your dialysis treatment. Most patients will treat you with respect, but some are not going to treat you with respect, guys. Every patient is entitled to your respect, though. It's not just because they were hateful with you, I get to be hateful back. It's your job to be professional at all times. You got to let things roll off your back. You can't be short-tempered. You can't be quick to anger in certain situations. Like I said, you have to learn to be the calm in the storm. Some of you guys are going to have to work on that a little bit. You know, some of you are going to have to work on your people skills a little bit. So, you know, that's something that personally you may have to, you know, take on and how to interact with people just a little bit better. As a new EMT, you're going to receive lots of advice and a lot of training from more experienced EMTs. Some may voice a pretty callous disregard for some types of patients. You should not be influenced by the unprofessional attitude of these individuals, regardless of how experienced or skilled that they are. You're also bound by patient confidentiality. If the patient loses their trust factor in you, and you violate HIPAA, not only is that punishable by a fine and possible imprisonment, but it's also going to lose your rapport with the community. And, well, not just your patient, your community, and these hospitals as well. Because trust me, if you violate a HIPAA violation, and they know you violated that HIPAA violation, just blatantly gave information out to the public, then they're not going to want to even give you something as simple as a face sheet when you ask for it. So make sure that you're honoring your patient's confidentiality. If there's a bad wreck and you respond to it, and it's the only fatality accident that Wyoming County seen in two years, and you start talking about this fatality accident, you need to be very aware of where you're talking about that at. Because trust me when I tell you, everywhere you go, 
people are listening to what you're saying whether you realize it or not and everywhere you go you're being videotaped and you should hold yourself as such meaning if you're on scene doing craziness you're going to get caught on camera doing it and then you're going to be held liable for your actions so you might as well just go into every situation imagining that you're being video recorded and pretend like Ashley and Tracy's watching you doing a check off and that you do things by the book every time.